would start today. I promised that we would move on beyond homicide, and we are moving on beyond homicide to uh, the next verse, which reads, Umake aviv ve'imo mot yumat. He who strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. I want to start, I'm going to talk about ideas here uh, in a little while, but I want to start with a technical issue related to this verse. Here's Ibn Ezra's comment on the verse. Umake yesharet ba'avur acher. The word umake, he who strikes, is to be read as if it were written twice. Okay, and now I'd like to pose the question, ma kashe le'ibn Ezra? What is bugging him? You look back at the, uh, at the verse, I'll get it in a second. Umake aviv imo mot yumat, and Ibn Ezra says, um, the word umake should be understood as if it is written twice. He doesn't tell us where we should be adding the word umake, but it, it should be written um, vayake. It should be written vayake or vayake. Okay. Uh, umake. The problem okay. is the mem. Uh, uh, this is not as common a style as vayake. Uh, however. There are examples uh, uh, like this, and, and that isn't what he's saying. What he's saying is you have to read the word umake as if it is written twice. What is the problem? If you just look at the Hebrew, don't look at the English, but if you just look at the Hebrew, what could be the problem? The problem is- I think it's my... Go ahead. If he kills both of them, then he gets capital punishment. But not necessarily if he kills only one of them. Ah, just that's Aviv right. That's right. Okay, very good. The problem is you can easily read this verse as saying, the person oh. who strikes his father and his mother shall be put to death. However, even Ezra says that that isn't the rule. And we know that that isn't the attention of the text. We know intuitively that that isn't what the text means. And so Ibn Ezra says that you should read it as if the verse says, umake aviv, umake imo mot yumat. The person who strikes his father and the person who strikes his mother are to be put to death. Uh, so that's, that's how uh, that's the problem that Ibn Ezra sees in this verse, and that's the solution that Ibn Ezra uh, suggests. Uh, Rabbi, as a, just as an aside. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Does anybody interpret it the other way? No, nobody interprets it another way. And uh, it, it's it, we will see places now where people where there is doubt about how to interpret the verse we'll, we'll see examples in a second this is a rule that even ezra uh, that this is something that even ezra does often sometimes he calls it misharet avur acher sometimes he calls it misharet avur shnaim and sometimes he calls moshech atzmo veacher imo that there's a certain word that it pulls itself along and it pulls another one along at, at, at the doubling of a word. Ibn Ezra wasn't the first uh, person who came up with this as a way of reading a number of biblical verses. We, you'll see more examples in a second. We've only seen one example for now, but we'll see more examples in a second. There were some uh, uh, lesser known Bible commentators who came up with this uh, method for reading difficult biblical verses before even Ezra came up. Ah, 
Very good. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that. that let, let's keep the cut. You're absolutely right, and we'll we'll get to that in, in, in a second. But let, let's try to keep the uh, keep the comments uh, until the uh, uh, until the end. Uh, but if you'd like to write things by chat or anything like that, uh, uh, go ahead. Um, Okay, so this this method of the, uh, of reading text was suggested by Ibn Ezra. Now Marty just suggested, Marty Crossell just suggested, there's another way to solve this problem. We'll talk about that way in a uh, in, in a second, but that isn't what Ibn Ezra suggests. So Ibn Ezra often writes that words should be read as if they were written. Twice, and he he very often says this in uh, passages of poetry, and in passages of poetry, there's no doubt that it is the case. For example, look at two verses here from Tehillim. Uh, if you look at the Hebrew, Hashem al ba'abcha tochicheni ve al ba'chamatcha. Tiasreini sound familiar for anybody who says Tachanun. That's uh, the beginning of the Tachanun prayer. But then you look in chapter thirty-eight, and it says Hashem al beketzbecha tochicheni uva chamatcha tiasreini. Now every translator in the world understands that that word al has to be read as if it were written twice. Do not punish me in wrath. Do not chastise me in fury. That's the JPS translation. But if you look at any translation, they all realize that that word has to be read as if it were written twice. Now, but people might argue that this is simply a characteristic of biblical poetry, which is built on the, uh, on the principle of parallelism, such as when Israel left Egypt, when the house of Jacob, a foreign country, and the word left has to be read. That's, that's, how, that's how parallelism works. Sometimes you have full parallelism and you repeat the, uh, uh, the, the same idea precisely, but just using different words. And sometimes some of the words or one of the words from the first, first part of the verse has to be read in the second part of the verse. So here in this example, in Psalm number 38, Ibn Ezra writes, Al Yisharet Ba'avur Acher. The word al has to be read as if it were written twice in the verse, as in the al bachamatcha tiasreini. So do not punish me in wrath, do not chastise me in fury. Here, nobody would give even Ezra an argument. Uh, so, you know, this is uh, trying to, uh, you know, bring you along slowly, step by step, if you please uh, seduce you in, in, into seeing that this is a, a possible way, and then see uh, where even Ezra sometimes goes with it. Okay, now we get to a verse that is a difficult verse, a famous verse from uh, the Zotah Bracha, from the Torah reading on Simchat Torah. And anybody who's in shul on Simchat Torah hears this Torah reading many, many times. And the question is, what does that verse mean? Yechi Reuven ve'al yamot vihi metav mispar. So you have two translations there into English on the right-hand side. And one of them follows Ibn Ezra's principle, and one of them does not follow Ibn Ezra's principle. Ibn Ezra says that the word the al has to be read twice. The al yamot, the al yehi metav mispar. So what does uh, what does metav mispar? mean? Is that something good or is that something bad? Uh, 
the, the word metav, it's not the word metav, it doesn't mean the ones who die. I mean, metav is a word, uh, an unusual word that appears almost only in poetic uh, context. Uh, it, it appears in other Semitic languages other than Hebrew, and, but, uh, uh, and in Hebrew it shows up almost entirely in uh, poetic passages and, uh, in, and in phrases like hacharim kol ir, Natim nashim vataf, destroying every city, natim, women and children. And so, natim is the is a biblical Hebrew word for men. And so, metav mispar means numbered men. Now, usually, when something is numbered, that isn't good. It means that it's a small number. Anoti, anochi, metei mispar. I, I, I only have a small number of men at my, uh, at, at my disposal, uh, is what that phrase means. And so, Ibn Ezra looks at this verse, and it says, it says, may Reuven live, may he not die, and let his men not be few. That's how Ibn Ezra understands the verse, by uh, positing that that word al, which appears in the first part of the poetic line, should appear in the second part of the uh, uh, of the poetic line. Ibn Ezra writes, Anything that's countable is uh, it means it's small, and that's why Jacob said, "Ani ba'ani mitay mispar." I, I only have a limited number of men at my disposal. That's why uh, Jacob was uh, afraid of being attacked because he had a small number of men at his uh, disposal. JPS, on the other hand, says that it means may Reuven live and not die even though his numbers are small, though few be his numbers. So here we are. Uh, the, the question where, where you know, we, uh, we see this principle of uh, the possibility of a word serving double duty. And do we do it here or do we not do it here? Rashi also doesn't do it here. He, he says, Vihi metav mispar. He sees that as meaning something good. May they be counted. May, may he continue to be counted among his brothers because there were, you know, uh, uh, Ruvain received. Uh, not much of a blessing from Jacob uh, in, in uh, at the end of uh, at the end of Genesis, and here at the end of Deuteronomy, uh, Rashi says that it means here, but he'll still be counted among the Jewish people. That's what he mitav mispar that he'll be counted. He he will count. Uh, both Korain and JPS and Ibn Ezra say that metav mispar really means a small number. And the question is, does it mean may his number not be small because we read the word ba'al twice? Or is this an even though class, may, a clause, may Reuven live and not die though few be his numbers. Okay, that's one uh, example of where it's unclear whether the word should or should not serve double duty. Here's another example. Uh, for their rock, JPS in 2006 translates, for their rock, meaning their God, is not like our rock, our God, in our enemy's own estimation. And they have a footnote that says, in other words, as everyone must admit, even the enemy realizes that their God is not as good as our God. But even Ezra says that the word low should be read from the first part of the poetic line into the second part of the poetic line. Ein lahem tzur ketzureinu, v'cheinu v'lo oiveinu pililim. They don't have a God like our God, and they aren't, our enemies aren't, are capable of judging. Pelilim uh, means judging or judgment or estimation, as JPS uh, translated. So again, uh, is should you read this as uh, serving double duty or not? Should you read that low twice? Now, even Ezra does uh, make an interesting point in a passage talking about prose. 
He writes here, I'll read it in English here. I previously explained in Sefer how you saw it in um, a grammar book that he wrote that it is possible in all languages to write briefly and to use an abbreviated style. However, it is impossible to leave out the word low, meaning no or not, for in this case, the meaning would be the opposite. So <laughs> Ibn Ezra makes that claim about prose, that in prose, you could never leave out the word uh, no. I once phoned up the, uh, the editor of a publication where I had an article uh, printed. Uh, uh, this was before the days of uh, where people just copied straight uh, from, uh, from a word file into a, uh, in, into a newspaper when the, actually in the days when people used to have typesetting and things like this. And I said to the editor, what word is the worst word to leave out in an article? And the editor said to me, the word not. He said, Marty, did we leave out the word not in an article of yours that we published? And I said, yeah, you did. Uh, so, because everything changes when you leave out the word not. So you, you can always use a short style. It, but even as we said, is that in poetry, you can leave out that word not, but in prose, you can't leave out the word not. Okay, so, uh, Marty Purcell said, that there's another way of solving this problem, and that is to say that va means or. You don't have to say umake aviv, umake imo motyumat. You can posit that the letter va can sometimes, we know that it usually means and, but it could also mean or, and that's why. The JPS translates here pretty well. Everybody translates here. He who strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. And then you look at the next verse and the same thing happens there, maybe. The gonev ish umecharo v'nimtza biyado motyumat. He who kidnaps a man, whether he has sold him or is still holding him. If, if you think of the word that the letter vav always means and, then you got a problem there with that the second verse there with verse 16. You've kidnapped somebody and you've sold him and he's in your possession. Oh, well, it's, you know, as they say in this country, you're osha, osha, it's one or the other. Either you sold him or uh, the person that you kidnapped is still in your possession. But the translator here translates, he who kidnaps a man, whether he has sold him or is still holding him. So if you can, if you can say that the letter Vav sometimes means or instead of meaning and, then you've also solved this, uh, this problem. The same thing happens, maybe, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, in the, another verse that talks about kidnapping, if a man is found to have kidnapped a fellow Israelite, enslaving him or selling him, is how JPS translates here. Itamerbo means that you know, you're using this man, uh, using and abusing this person. And mecharo means that you sold him. And again, you know, it's seems to be Osha Osha, and the, the translator here says that umecharo has to be understood as or selling him. Uh, and in fact, if you look in, you know, the best uh, English uh, dictionary of biblical Hebrew, the Brown, Driver, Briggs, Hebrew and English lexicon of the Old Testament, you find uh, the, the fourth definition of the is it connects alternative cases so that it equals or. So the, the, the authors of this biblical uh, dictionary say that that's what Bob sometimes means. Uh, this is the fourth definition of Bob. And th these are the examples that they give from, they begin with our verse here about make avi vimo and gone vi shumacharo. And then they give other examples. Almana, Ugarusha, Vachalala, Zona, Edele, Loikach. 
This is a, an instruction for the high priest that he should not marry a widow or a divorcee or uh, someone who has been uh, defiled. That, in, in, that in, in, election? Sorry. Uh, let, let, let's keep the, the the questions for later if we could. I, I just uh, all right. I guess too, no too, big a, too, too, big, too big a crowd to have uh, uh, to, okay. to have participants in the minute okay. in the middle. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, Brown Driver Briggs says it doesn't mean a woman who has been widowed and uh, divorced and uh, desecrated in in some way. Gives another example. The shore of Ase Sarua the Kalut, Nidavata Aseoto, a an ox or a sheep, that is Sarua or Kalut. Those are difficult words, but it doesn't mean that it's both of those things. It means either an ox or a sheep that is Sarua or that is Kalut can be made as a Nidava. And then he gives an example that is debatable. Ishacham. Nishpat et ish evil, the ragaz, the sahak, the ain nachat. So Brown Driver uh, Briggs thinks that the ragaz, the sahak, should be understood as either or. And the Korean Tanakh translation follows this understanding. A wise man in a legal dispute with a fool, he may show anger or he may smile but there is never satisfaction. You can't win when you get into a fight with a fool. Uh, if you're, doesn't matter what you do, do. Viragas, visachak, meaning whether you decide to show anger or whether you decide to smile, gurnish helfen, ein nacha, that doesn't help. That, that, and, and, and neither of those is going to work. JPS doesn't agree with that understanding. When a wise man enters into litigation with a fool, with a fool, there is ranting and ridicule, but no satisfaction. So uh, the, the question is whether sachak means smiling or means ridicule. So JPS thinks that it means ridicule, and that means there. But if you get into a fight with a fool, there's going to be ranting and ridicule, but nothing good is going to come out of it. And the Korean Tanakh says that it means whether you show anger or you smile, you aren't going to win in the situation where you're arguing with a fool. So, so we know that the that the can, as Marty uh, was the first to point out to us, and now we see Brown Driver Briggs uh, saying this. Uh, it's a different way of getting around the problem that even Ezra was trying to get around. He's uh, by saying that the can mean or. And I will point out that that happens in Mishnah Hebrew too. The troll, Grusha Bachalutza min ha Erusin Kdubatan Matai. A betrothed woman who, uh, who was divorced or who went through a chalitza ceremony receives a ketubah of 200 zoos. Uh, uh, you could, in theory, understand grushava chalitza, meaning a woman who's been through a divorce ceremony and a chalitza ceremony. But obviously, when it says grushava chalitza, it means a divorced woman or a woman who went through a chalitza ceremony. Uh, another example, nechasim sheyesh lahem achrayud niknim bekesef uvishtar uvachazaka. Ownership of uh, property can be effected either through money or through a document or through chazaka. And you know, you could, again, you could chazaka means actually using the item. And in theory, you could say it, it would mean and. So that there'd be nothing impossible in understanding that. It just I, we happen to know from studying the Gemara that that isn't what they mean. That it mean that they mean that any one of these things could work for effecting the transfer of property, kesef or shtar or chazaka. Uh, but just realizing the logical possibility, you, you might say that in order to transfer property, you need to pay money, you need to have a deed, and you need to actually have the person go and use the property. And then we have effected the transfer of the property, but that isn't what it means. Uh, and it, it, sometimes it is totally clear to the reader of a text whether the means 
and or or it means or and sometimes as we've already seen it isn't all that clear um, for example rambam following the talmud says about a kidnapper the kidnapper does not receive the capital penalty of choking of chenek unless he steals an israelite brings him home uses him and sells him to someone else so all those vs there that I said a few minutes ago, that they clearly on the pshat level mean or, Rambam following the Talmud disagrees. Now it's possible that the Talmud and Rambam just want to be more lenient here and saying that the death penalty wouldn't actually be used unless all of these things are done. But again, it shows the, uh, the, the difficulty of saying something, uh, of saying something definitive about that simple letter V that we all think after we've studied Hebrew for, uh, for a week that we know what it means, but now we are discovering that we don't always know what it means. However, uh, as uh, to, to answer the question as, uh, as Shalom uh, 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 phrased it, did anybody ever suggest that when the verse said, that the verse is only referring to somebody who actually struck both his mother and his uh, and his father. No, there is. Uh, I, I've never seen anybody who's made that uh, suggestion. Okay, so that's the technical part about the uh, about the bab here. And now let's look at these three verses here. Uh, so the three verses that come after the section about homicide. Who you strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. He who kidnaps a man, whether he has sold him or is still holding him. That's uh, again, that's how JPS uh, understands the Vav there. And I think that that is the best way to uh, understand it. Shall be put to death. Umakalel, and then again, the, the, the same structure for the next verse. Umakalel aviv eviimom motiumatiu curses. JPS thinks that reviles is a better translation of makalel. Either way, uh, uh, it, 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 you have to translate his father or his mother shall be put to death. It doesn't mean both of them. Uh, if you look at this list here, uh, we have verses 15 and 17 are talking about parents and verse 16 isn't talking about parents, it's talking about kidnapping. It's a pretty strange way to organize the material. And, you know, we've been discussing since the beginning of this chapter, the organization of the material. We began with the question, why did the laws all begin with um, uh, it, it, with the laws of slaves. And then why did we go on to homicide after the laws of slaves? And now what are we going to do with the order of what's going on here? So here's what Rashbam says. Since they were already told, you shall not murder. And also they were told, honor your father and your mother. Now in verses 12 to 15 and verse 17, the text explains the penalty involved if one breaks those laws. So Rashbam is continuing a theme that we saw before in his commentary that is suggesting that the laws of Mishpatim are in a certain sense an elaboration of the Ten Commandments. And since the Ten Commandments said, you shall not murder, and it also says, honor your father and your mother. And so that's why 12 to 15 and 17 are here, but what about 16? So Rashbam says, similarly, one should explain that the verse here he who kidnaps a man and sells him is written as an elaboration of the penalty for a law written in the Ten Commandments in the Decalogue in Exodus 20, you shall not steal. And the rabbis explained that the verse refers to kidnapping. And so what we have is uh, general principles being established by, uh, 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 by the Ten Commandments and then the laws being uh, the expansion of the laws here. A, num a number of weeks ago, we saw this principle in, um, in uh, Shadal's commentary 
on the beginning of uh, on the first verse of this chapter, Shadal says that now we have reached Mishpatim. Mishpatim means detailed laws. He said in the Ten Commandments, we had principles. We had ideas, but not details. But now we're getting into details. And uh, Rashbam says that, first of all, the uh, first detail that we're getting into is what is the penalty for these, uh, for these uh, crimes. Ibn Ezra says, Umakeh Ba'abur. So Ibn Ezra, uh, I, I think, is now pointing us in a good direction to understand what is going on in the basic structure of chapter 21 here of the beginning of Parshat Mishpatim. Since scripture had previously mentioned he who fatally strikes a man shall be put to death, back in verse 12, scripture had to explain that there is an, an in, there is an instance where one is put to death for striking someone, even when the one who is struck does not die. This is the case when one strikes one's father or one's mother. So there, there is... Uh, Ibn Ezra is suggesting that after establishing the principle of the gravity of killing another human being, the text goes on to say that even striking another human being can be a very grievous thing to do, a very terrible thing to do, if that human being happens to be your mother or your father. Um, but then even as we get uh, kind of stuck a little bit. So that explains, you know, 12 to 14 is about homicide and 15 is about striking your parents. So that, that worked really nicely. But then we got a problem when we go on to verse 16, just to recall the order of the text. 15 is striking a parent. 17 is cursing a parent. 16 is kidnapping. So Ibn Ezra is a little stuck here about what to do with 16. And so he doesn't seem to have a, a, uh, an explanation that he's perfectly happy with, but he, uh, he borrows a, an explanation from Sadia Gaon. Sadia Gaon asks, why was this verse about kidnapping inserted between he who smites his father and he who curses his father? You know, the verses 15 and 17 are on the same theme of honoring parents. So why is kidnapping uh, uh, interrupting this thematic unit about parents? He answers that scripture speaks about the most common occurrences. And the phrase in the Hebrew is hakatuv yudaber al ha'oveh. Oveh in modern Hebrew means present tense, but oveh uh, in rabbinic Hebrew means the common occurrence. Uh, the uh, scripture talks about the most common occurrence. What's the most common occurrence? The people who are stolen are usually young children. They are brought up in a strange country and they don't recognize their parents and it is thus possible for them to strike and curse their parents and the punishment for this would fall upon the kidnappers. A, a bit of a dre here to try to figure out why we have here between the verse about hitting a parent and the verse about cursing a parent, we have a verse about kidnapping. It's time to tell us that, you know what? What's wrong with kidnapping? There are many things that are wrong with kidnapping, but one of the things that is wrong about kidnapping is that the person won't know who his parents are and might end up then, this might remind people of Oedipus or various other stories about people who are brought up and don't know who their parents are and end up meeting their parents uh, later, in, uh, later in life. Um, that's why they threw the kidnapping in there between striking the parent and cursing the parent. As I said, not the most, uh, uh, not the most impressive way, or the, 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 let me put it differently, not, not the most convincing way to explain the, uh, the order of these verses. Um, I should just say that years ago when I taught this material, I had thought that Professor 
Moshe David or Umberto Casuto was the uh, was the one who had discovered this explanation that we're about to read, and then I found out, and then I started reading a little more in the medieval uh, biblical commentaries, and I saw the uh, this comment of Yosef before Shore, and I said, oh. It wasn't uh, Casuto's uh, invention. Casuto also came up with a lot of great, uh, uh, great ideas on his own, but this is one that is uh, first suggested by Yosef uh, before Shore, whose commentary might not actually have been available for uh, Casuto. I don't know how available it was in the beginning of the uh, of, of the twentieth century. Actually. I, I do know that it was a printing at the end of the 19th of Bohorshor's commentary, so it, it should have been available. Okay, uh, since the text said above, he who fatally strikes a man, I might have thought that there is no death penalty unless one kills a man. Accordingly, the text now enumerates capital crimes that do not involve killing someone, such as striking a parent, kidnapping, and cursing a parent using God's name. That's the common halachic understanding of the mekalil, avi, v'imo. It doesn't mean just uh, swearing at a parent, but it means swearing at a parent using God's name. Uh, it's a saying, may, may God bring the following curse down uh, 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 upon you. Uh, so does anybody see where he is going. We've got striking a parent, then we have kidnapping, and then we have cursing. So here's what the horse shore does with this. The flow of the verses follows the low zoo, up zoo pattern. Not just this, but this too. The idea that you say to someone, Here's the rule, and it doesn't just apply here, but it also applies in this situation too that you might not have thought of going from the smaller chidush to the greater uh, to the greater chidush. Uh, instead of explaining just the idea uh, away from context, let's look at it in context here of what Yosef Bechorshor is saying here. Sometimes offenders are culpable even if no one died, for example, when they strike a parent. Sometimes even if the offenders neither struck nor physically harmed a person such as a kidnapper. And sometimes even without stealing, striking, or even touching someone like cursing a parent. So this is like the increasing chidush. First of all, it says that there could be the death penalty for killing somebody. And then it says, well, sometimes there's death penalty for striking someone, even if you didn't kill them. And sometimes even you didn't actually, and uh, the halachic literature understands that striking doesn't just mean slapping, it means leaving a mark. Uh, that there has to be uh, uh, there has to be a mark left on the parent for the, it to be considered a uh, a capital crime from the child. So begins by saying not just killing but also striking, and then it says not just striking but also if you kidnap somebody and you didn't actually physically harm them but you just move them from one place to another, that is uh, uh, also a capital crime. And sometimes when you didn't even touch the person and didn't move them anywhere, such as cursing a parent. Uh, personally, I think that this is a uh, an excellent understanding of what is going on here in chapter 21. And if you look at the general flow of chapter 21 of the verses that we looked at this week and at the verses that we're going to be looking at in following weeks, notice what is happening here. We begin, verses 12 to 14 are talking about murder, intentional and accidental. And then we have striking a parent, and then we have kidnapping, and then we have cursing a parent, and then we have injuring someone who does not die right away. That's the uh, uh, passage that we'll look at next week. How, how do you determine 
whether when somebody dies, that person has died as the result of an injury that uh, someone inflicted on them. You know, I, as, I, I, I think we know today that uh, of course of law rely on, uh, on autopsies uh, often to determine what the cause of death was. And uh, you know, uh, thank God I've never been at a real murder trial, but I've re read uh, about a lot of them, uh, particularly when wasting my time reading uh, mystery novels, which I love to uh, to read. And you know, that they're always trying to uh, establish what the cause of death was uh, in order to be able to say uh, uh, who the guilty party was. But Back in uh, biblical times, autopsies were not a developed art. So the question of deciding uh, what actually led to the death of the person who died becomes a question for the biblical text to be talking about. And then we get into the issue of feticide. And we will also be looking at the text to talk about this. And these are, of course, um, crucial texts for understanding what is going on in the United States of America and in, uh, and in other countries in the world in which uh, debates are, uh, are, are taking place about, uh, uh, about the rights of fetus and whether life begins at conception. And, and uh, so we will be looking at texts that are, that are directly uh, relating to this issue that are coming up here. So here, I, I, I think you see that after the striking the parent, kidnapping and cursing the parent, we're getting into these like borderline kinds of situations. Somebody was injured and then they don't die right away, but they die a week later, a month later, uh, two months later, uh, how do we know whether to attribute the death to the, uh, to the injury that was inflicted on them? And what about the fetus? You know, what, what do we think about the, uh, what do we think about the fetus? So we won't begin the discussion on this today, but we will uh, begin uh, either next week or the week after. Then the text goes on to discuss bodily injuries such as loss of limb. Uh, this is, you know, uh, what do you do? Uh, what, what, these are obviously not bodily injury, loss of limb. These are obviously not uh, capital uh, situations. The penalty for bodily injury for the loss of a uh, for, for the loss of a limb is not going to be capital punishment. But uh, the so we have the like descending order of uh, or you might say ascending order of surprise in what are considered um, capital crimes for the first four things here. And then we get to things that are, aren't precisely, just really aren't all that clear. Uh, and so what do you do with bodily injury with loss of a limb? And then we get into the, uh, the question that uh, uh, seems to be of, Great interest to the uh, to Parshat Mishpatim to the Covenant Code, and anybody who has ever studied the uh, studied Gemara knows that this is something that the rabbis uh, love to talk about: the goring ox. Uh, the and it is really an interesting question because when you think about it, um, if my animal does damage that I did not cause it to do. Uh, I think that in, those of us who live in cities, and I assume that pretty well everybody here tuned in today lives in a city, there is an assumption that, uh, there is an assumption that people who own animals will uh, watch over their animals, but, <laughs> In, in the old days when uh, people had goat, sheep and goats and uh, it wasn't that they were in their house and all the time and a whole bunch of them, 
was it really possible to be watching all of your animals uh, all the time? We, we, we kind of assume today that anybody who owns an animal has a responsibility to be watching that animal. I am, uh, uh, I am flabbergasted when I go uh, running, uh, I'm sorry, when I, I don't run anymore, but when I go uh, riding my bike on the bicycle path around the corner from me here in Jerusalem, and, and some people are out there with their dogs that aren't on leashes, and they're just, you know, letting the <laughs> dogs run around, not on, uh, not on leashes on a bicycle path. I, you know, I, I don't think that that's a good idea to, uh, to, to do something like that. Um, so we make the assumption that, that, that any owner of an animal in the city is, it, it will be responsible for injuries that are caused by their animal. But in a society where people used to have many more animals than we have today, I'm not so sure that that was a no-brainer. And, uh, and, and so the, uh, the biblical text has to get into great detail about what the status of injuries that are caused by an animal. And for those of you who don't remember all the details, I'll just tell you ahead of time, the answer that is given by the Torah is not like the most intuitive answer that you might think of. The most intuitive answers are either, oh, of course you are fully responsible for the injury that's caused by any animal that you own, that you own, or the other intuitive answer is, you're not responsible for injury that is caused by an animal that you own, uh, but neither of those is the answer given as anybody who has studied Baba Kama or has paid very careful attention when Mishpatim is read in Shul, neither of those is the answer that's given by the text. So we're moving on. We begin with the uh, clearest offense, the offense of murder, move to other things that the uh, Torah wishes to put into that category of really serious uh, crimes, and then moving on to, uh, to uh, other forms of damage that seem to be either descending order or confusing situations where we don't precisely know what to do in all of these situations. And here's what uh, uh, Professor Casuto uh, writes in uh, his commentary here on chapter 21. In this paragraph in the section that we're uh, talking about here are enumerated five cases carrying the penalty of death beginning with the gravest crime. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies. And then saying the law applies even if the assailant seeks refuge in the precincts of the sanctuary that we saw that last week, the discussion about that. C, whoever strikes his father or his mother. D, whoever steals a man. E, whoever dishonors his father or mother. In the next paragraph, five cases of bodily injury will be cited. The first of which is connected with the present paragraph, namely the case of one who strikes another and the victim does not die, but keeps to his bed. So then we have we have these uh, 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 two different sets. I counted it up as uh, as four and four, uh, but he counts it up as five and five. But anyways, you see how the pattern of the text that the text that often appears to be um, this is the question that we first raised when we started reading Parshat Mishpatim when Ibn Ezra said. Each law stands on its own. When I'm capable of, I'll come up with an explanation to connect one law to the next law, but each law stands on its own. And you know, I, I, I pose the question whether in the criminal code of Canada or in, in, in other uh, countries, is, is there care always taken that the laws will be written in a specific order? Uh, no, there isn't necessarily uh, uh, Something like that. But in the Bible, is there some other form? So Professor Casuto is arguing that there is. Okay. Okay, I'm going to uh, take a look at uh, what we have here in the uh, Marty, chat. Yes? I just want to tell you, Rabbi J um, Sachs yes? wrote a wonderful article about abortion with the stressing Philo's interpretation of a son. 
So, we'll get to that uh, next week. I, know, we'll I don't know if you have it. I just wanted to say it's. Okay, thank you. We will get to that. Uh, okay. Uh, let me see. Source, source sheets. Uh, okay, I will try to send uh, send the source sheets to that uh, address. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, Susanna, like Marty pointed out, the vav can. How do you know when to make the vav mean and or when to make it mean or? The, yes, that is the big question. Or it then becomes an arb arbitrary choice uh, of the commentary. I agree that it is a difficulty. It, it, it is a difficulty of the Hebrew language that the Hebrew language has this. Uh, uh, has this ambiguity. English has ambiguities too, but this is an ambiguity. And that's why I gave you a number of examples of verses that seem to work with and and that seem to work with or. And, uh, and, and sometimes you can tell from the greater context. I, I argue that from the greater context of Talmudic literature, we know that, uh, that uh, it's not hitting both your... Uh, mother and your father, but there are other cases that we saw when it's uh, definitely un unclear. Uh, the rabbinic will was to make it easier for Kohanim to marry, they would interpret it as and, and, and similar when they wanted to limit such as principle to limiting death of rebellious uh, child and parental voices. That's true, that it, it is available to, uh, to do that. And so the explanation that I gave for why Rambam uh, uh, seems to be more lenient about the kidnapper, whoever iPad is, who uh, makes this point, is making a, a very correct point that it's hard to make to 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 say that uh, principle consistently. Uh, yes, Aisha Niknate Susanna. Yes, I was thinking of bringing that example. It's not my favorite uh, example. Uh, in, as a matter of fact, my daughter who teaches uh, Mishnah and Gemara all the time. I phoned her up last night and I said to her, "You got a good example other than Aisha Niknate for uh, showing that Bob can mean." That Bob can mean or somebody's somebody's got somebody's on uh, uh there we go uh I asked her can you come come up with an example other than Haishad Niknate and she said to me well Abba you've got all those other Mishnayot right after Haishad Niknate that also to, uh, use this same uh the same style and that's why I use that style about how how to acquire uh, I should give an assist uh, to my daughter Hannah who suggested to me to give that example that the acquiring of property can be effected with kesef ushtar vechazaka uh, meaning either this or that. Uh, okay. If I'm not mistaken, says, in the Yerushalmi or in the Baraita, it says specifically, O oh, Kesef, oh, yeah, Star O oh, Kesef. Ah, it, 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 in the case of the woman, are you saying? Or in yes, the in the case of, of Isha, Ha'isha Niknate. Oh, I, th I think, I think in the, either in the Yerushalmi or in a Baraita, it's been 50 years since I studied this, um, I seem to remember that there was, you know, oh, you know, specifically Aleph Vav. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, uh, I'll take a look. Uh, thank you for uh, pointing that, that out. Uh, so Cassie points out in that verse where the, we had that ambiguity. I assume uh, that that's where it came from, whether uh, stalk means ridicule or does it mean smiling? Uh, is there anywhere in the Torah, Nietzsche asks, in which laws of homicide or other crime says, or so uh, uh, there is according to the way i have uh, presented the law about kidnapping here and i don't think that it makes any sense to read it, uh, uh, any other way the law as it appears here uh whether you sold the person that you kidnapped or whether that person is still in your possession, that uh, understanding the uh, vav there, 
uh, in the case of that crime is meaning or. Janine says more and more Jews are returning to farming in the United States. More and more people are having animals, uh, animals in their home. I remember when I uh, when I first learned the story of uh, the, the awful story of uh, Yiftach uh, making the uh, uh, making that uh, promise that the first creature that would come out of uh, that would come out of the uh, his house would uh, would become a sacrifice to God, uh, my teacher said that people had lots of animals at home, and they, you know, they, and the, uh, that the, uh, it, it was, it was a very stupid thing for him to do, as we know from the continuation of that story, but what he was thinking is that every time he comes home, uh, there's usually some uh, sheep or some goat or something like that that's in the, uh, that, that's outside the home. And that's the first thing that he sees when he comes home. And the first thing that I see that when I come home will become the, uh, will become the, uh, a sacrifice. Okay. Uh, good seeing you all. And uh, we'll see you again uh, next week. And uh, Everyone should have a good week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.